Okay, hey guys. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming for this session. Uh, my name is Samir. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called R2. What we are trying to do is, you know, use Android and cloud for the benefit of the masses. So, you know, many companies that work directly with the poor, whether they are trying to provide financial services or healthcare, they operate through field agents and field agents who have a technology barrier, a language barrier, right? So we are trying to use intuitive touch screens built on Android, you know, and sort of connect that through the cloud and make things happen, right? That's a little bit about us. Now, before I start, sort of just to get a sense of how many of you have sort of heard of Jenkins or continuous integration first. How many of you have sort of or work with continuous integration? Okay, so that's great. That's a large number of people. And so you would have obviously heard of Jenkins, right? And there was a session by Kostov earlier which sort of introduced Jenkins. So, you know, our, you know, we were also very excited about continuous integration, right? It suddenly means, okay, now you can build, there's a process and things like that. Before that, you had a very ad hoc process, right? Everyone would suddenly say, okay, I'm committing changes, wait, wait, wait for an hour, you know, don't push stuff to the cloud, I'm going to do this. And then when we got Jenkins, which is this continuous integration system, then the problem suddenly changed. Then it became about, okay, who's going to run it? You know, who's going to sit with it and sort of wait for it to finish and do the next set of steps, right? Not everything sort of takes place only at Jenkins. So I'm going to talk about this new thing called Whobot, which can try and simplify this entire interface, right? And make things a lot more fun for your small team. So, so first of all, you know, I, I look at myself more as a suit, you know, because if, uh, I also handle the business part. But sort of Jenkins, uh, Whobot knows me like this, you know, with a little moustache. Is this clear? Okay, so we, I'm going to show you how you can make such images also. This is a fun part of Hoobot, using Hoobot, right? Um, I've also hosted this presentation on this link. So if you guys have laptops and if you want to look at some of the scripts in better detail, you can look at, you know, you can go to this link. So let's start with the problem, right? So as I was mentioning, this is the kind of challenge that you face in the small team. Suddenly the person who is designated, in our case we are just four employees, right? And just because one of us knows a little more about than the others or has some idea of what the others are doing, suddenly it becomes my responsibility to be the build guy, right? And then suddenly I become the bottleneck because now people are committing and they start, of, you know, start depending on you, right? And typically you have two sets of processes. One is you take the stuff to your build server and that gives you an output. Typically you store that on S3 or some sort of storage and then you get your cloud to pick up that file and sort of update this, you know, your cloud, right? So there was a nice session on Puppet before this earlier in the morning, right? Now, so this is, this is what we face today at work. Then we came across this interesting deck uh, by the founder of GitHub. It talks about how GitHub uses GitHub to build GitHub. Okay, so it's really interesting. You should definitely go through these set of slides. I think they're sort of 40 plus slides, or more than that. Is is this clear? Not very clear, right? So, so what he talks about is that they work asynchronously. Now, this is a team that's about 52 employees. They spread all across the world, and pe different people wake up at different time and do work, right? And so for them, they have to work asynchronously, right? At a startup, you would like to have this flexibility. Then what happens is that, you know, th so this is a small diagram showing that how a trusted developer becomes a gatekeeper and therefore the bottleneck. So what they came up with is a simple model. You have the master branch, which is always, which will always hold your deployable code, right? So whenever you suddenly need to deploy, you'll take code from your master branch. And everyone else will create little, little branches from this. Uh, Samir will work here and, and Uttam and others will work on other branches. And everyone can push and then they can deploy. Right? So the idea was to make it more democratic. Right? Now anyone can sort of build, anyone can push. Right? Of course you need to have permissions in place. But the idea was to build a process this, that allows everyone to push and everyone to deploy. That's really hard. And that's where Hubot comes in and does a good job. So what is Hubot? I'll just sort of step to my screen. So this is my GTalk terminal and you can see over there, oh, it's not really long screen. So 
So the resolution changed. That's why I connected with the projector. Is this visible? No. Okay, is it, I'll, I'll use this thing then. Uh, this is visible? Okay, so this is nothing, the, this is the iChat client. It's connected to my Gmail. So I'm going to say hi to him. Let me try and increase the point. Right. So I say hi to him. He sort of responds back saying R2 at your service. And I'm going to ask him how is my cloud doing. Just a simple question mark. So he's saying cloud is doing fine. And I'm going to thank him for his service. Right. So he's going to say you're welcome. And I'm going to say bye to him politely. <laughs> so it's a nice speaking to you. Right. So it's just a simple thing. It's a program that's running at the back that's simply sort of responding to your commands. But this becomes a very fun way to interact with the system. Right? So this is Hubot, that it is a bunch of things, it's written on Node, it's written with, you know, copy script and you can make, so you can make a script to do anything, right? So you can simply make commands that can respond using regex, so it basically understands, okay, you said hi, bye, thanks and things like that and then it can run a command, right? So what I'm going to do is sort of go back to the presentation, just for completeness sake, I'm going to talk about, okay, how can you install this? So instructions are fairly straightforward. You need Node, you need the package manager, coffee script, and then you can install Hubot. Now what we've done differently is we normally Hubot is used with Campfire or HipChat or one of those things, right? And those are paid services. Whereas we spend a lot of time on GTalk, so we thought we'll connect it to GTalk. And there's an adapter available for GTalk, so we just straightforward use that. And running it is as simple. You provide the environment variables, which are your you know, uh, gtalk username password and sort of what code it needs to run on and you can start this. Then, so if you want to know what all it's capable of, you can simply type help and you'll get a list of commands that it can do. Right? So I'm going to go, go into this a little later. <laughs> We've connected this to talk to our Jenkins. Right? So I'm going to say Jenkins list. So it's showing me a list of you know jobs that we have running and it's saying okay this one has passed, this one has failed and you know these are all passed. Right? Can you see this? Text is okay. So I'm just gonna say Jenkins build you know how to play that's a framework that we use. I'm just gonna give it this command and it actually starts a build job in the background. Right? So if you come here We'll just wait for, I'm just going to say enable order refresh. And you can see that a job has already started over here. Right? And, sorry, it's over here. And I can go and I can see the... Sorry. So I can see the log if I would like to, and then you know, it's doing its work, it's downloading from Git and it's doing other things, right? And at the end of this, it you can see it sort of places it on S3 for us. Okay, if you see the last set of lines, it, it talks about S3, a repository and things like that. When our servers, ref, uh, when you want to sort of refresh the code on our servers, they'll pick it up from that repository, right? Now this is how your regular build process would work, right? Where one person is sort of sitting and saying, okay, on the master branch, let me go build it, let me deploy it on S3 and then run a script to run it on Google Cloud, right? But what about sort of your interns or other people who want to simply run tests to see whether their code worked or not, right? There's something called as parameterized build in Jenkins. That is, you can provide parameters at runtime that can change the way it behaves, right? So over here, you can see I have this simple project um, I'm going to go into configure and it takes a simple parameter called branch okay and so you need to supply what branch do you want it to build okay if you look at our github um, <coughs> so 
So our GitHub repository looks like this. We have about three other branches apart from master. So there are three other people who are working on this thing, and they're working. And I can just make this a little bit Okay. So, so these are sort of each point is a commit, right? This is how GitHub works. This is a beautiful way to define things. So now what I can do is, if I'm interested in just building my <coughs> branch and seeing how it looks, I can say Jenkins, you know, build my web with branch equal to Samir. Okay, and I can see he sent me a link to my to that particular project, right? And you can see that it's it's just waiting. There's some amount of quiet time. It waits until you want to pull it back if you. So again, what this does is it can actually, you know, uh, it's picking up from the Samir branch, the code, and it's going to run. And at the end of it, it's going to run tests, and it's going to show you the results of those tests. These tests will fail because I've sort of messed up with my branch. Uh, but this is how the rest of your team, you know, they may not be necessarily responsible for the end product, right? I mean, the end sort of build process, but they can quickly run their tests and they can understand what's happening, right? And they can get quick feedback. And they can do it in sort of a sanitized environment, like you know your build environment, and they can get their own response. Right? Is this making sense? Does it seem something like you guys will use. So to enable this, it was fairly simple. You know, we just simply used uh, we connected it to Jenkins as a script for Jenkins. Okay. So now to a little bit of fun stuff. So you know the way GitHub. So GitHub is open source the code for Hubot, right? And they described it as the most, you know, a, a project that increases their productivity and also a project that decreases their productivity. It depends on how you use it, right? So there are fun things like, you know, you can type, when you're a little bored, you can type fuck me, okay? And what it does is, it gives you a little picture of a pug, a random picture of a pug, you know, say there are various funny scripts like this. Right. And you can also type, you know, mustache me and your name. Right. And hopefully you should see an image of me looking like Mangal Pandey. Sure. There are a bunch of adapters. I don't remember seeing a Skype adapter, but um, you could definitely use it. Jenkins itself can directly work with Skype. So, and, yeah, and if I want as long as you can communicate with it, right? I mean, if your ports are not blocked and if it's still accessible, it should work. It shouldn't be a problem. So, the way this is working is you're using. Yeah, sorry. This is how I look like Mangal Pandey. Uh, but the way it works is, so we will go a little deeper into that and I can show you how you can write scripts, right? But what we what are, what we have done is we are hosting Jenkins as a web app, okay? And on that same instance, we are also storing Gen, uh, Hubot. So Hubot is listening to a particular socket, right? In the previous slide, you saw port 555, is listening onto that port. It's interacting with Jenkins using HTTP protocol, okay? So they don't need to be on the same machines, right? There is there are other ways to interact with Jenkins, but we are using simple HTTP. So a bunch of other things that you can do with this are you can have a lot of other funny scripts. Where you have to be careful; some of them are quite inappropriate, not suitable for work. Uh, so there are simple things like you know commit message. So if you sometimes you can't figure out a nice commit message, you can you know refer to this. And then there are some funny quotes. There are yo mama jokes and things like that. But that's anyway beside the point. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So what you can do is you can use that. You can write your own script, right? So what I'll show you next is how do you write your own script? Okay. So uh, how many of you have sort of worked with Coffee Script before? Okay, fairly few people. But how many of you have worked with JavaScript? Right? A lot more people. So sort of coffee script is 
like another level, a higher level version of JavaScript. You know, does away with curly braces and things like that. It looks a lot like a functional programming language, but at the end of the day, it's JavaScript. So, you know, you can look at. Uh, sorry, I'll just go to this link. This just sort of give you a sense of the variety of you know things people have built. So this is a. These are all the scripts that are out there that you know that can work with Ubot, right? And so most of them are sort of funny scripts, but there are a few which are like productivity related. Um, Anyway, so I mean, I'll, I'll leave this for you guys. I can't see anything right now. In most. So, how do you write a script for Hubot, right? So, you saw my first script, that cloud script, right? It was actually a sham because all it does is it searches for the word cloud and then responds that cloud is doing fine, right? It's fairly simple. It's just three lines of code. This is what's called uh, torn doc. That is, this is what's displayed when you do help. You know, when I type that help message, it would have shown me that okay, if you type cloud, you'll get a reassuring message saying you know cloud is working fine. Um, if you're familiar with Node, this is sort of how you export a particular function. There's a simple you know regex that you're doing. You're just checking the message, you know whether cloud was mentioned in it or not, and it's case insensitive, and then you just send out a simple message, right? Cloud is doing fine. Now this is a fairly simple script to do. Right, I mean it's very limited in its uh, in its functionality, but this also shows you what all is possible. Right, the moment you've done your regex expression over here, now you can do anything else you want. Right, you can reach out to other systems, other services, web services, or you can even run sort of shell scripts. Right, so the next thing that I'm going to show you is you know an interesting thing that I just wrote today is if I want to know get a list of all our servers. Right. So we use RightScale. RightScale is a, a proprietary platform to manage your Amazon infrastructure. Right. So over here we are having sort of 11 servers up and running at the moment, and I'm just getting sort of you know a simple nickname for the server and a status that it's operational. And if I click on the link, right. So <coughs> let me click on this link. I can actually go to go there and see my server and see sort of graphs associated with it. Okay. <coughs> Maybe I'm not locked in, sorry. Anyway, so this is, this, I mean, this is right scale, this is not anything, you, know, you can sort of see graphs. And the next step for us would be to sort of get these graphs directly into our GTOP, right? So you directly say, okay, fetch me CPU levels for this particular server, right? Now, how do we do this, right? So what I did in this case was, so this is a regular expression, RS space list that I'm searching for. As soon as I match that, I check for environmental variables that have been set, a username, password, and account number, and then I run a script. Okay, so this is a script that is running on the server, right? And the result of the script, I simply put that onto the message and I send it out, right? So those of us who are sort of familiar and comfortable with shell scripting can easily use this. Now, what is the, sorry, what does the script look like? So look at the first script. Okay. So it's a very simple script. It's taking, you know, the uh, authentication, you know, username, password, and then it gets an authentication token from that service, and then it goes and finds out, okay, how the server is doing, right? I get an XML, you know, it's the response, right? And the response looks okay. I'll, I'll show you the response later, but that's sort of immaterial. And then I run a Perl script to parse that response, right? And 
what that looks like is again fairly simple. It's just simple XML parsing, right? So those of us who are comfortable with sort of command line and Perl and things like that can set up real complex jobs, right? And all you need to do is simply match your regular expression and kick off events. Right? So it becomes fairly interesting and sort of the rest of your team can do. Now coming back to your question about can you have permissions in this? So your permissions would again lie on this, right? You can get the username, you can match against the username and say, okay, this person is allowed. So you want Sorry? Yeah. So, so Hubot uh, has uh, has only like you know two two properties to it, right? So it has its own username password from which it signs into your Zito, and the second is it can whitelist certain usernames or it can whitelist certain domain names, right? I don't want you guys to suddenly add this guy and then start running jobs on our system, right? So, so we whitelisted and said only if you have an r2.in ID, then you can work with it. But the rest of the stuff you can sort of build on your own over here. The best way to start on building scripts is to look at someone else's script. Right? Just sort of get a sense of how they're structured. There are a few interesting scripts, you know, uh, the typical examples people share are, you know, the, there's a tweet script. Okay, so you search for a term and space tweet, and it'll find you all the tweets that reference that term. So like if today we've been doing root conf, right? So we could do root conf to it, okay? Let me just see if it works. So it's sending me, it's giving me one person's. Yeah, so it works. So yeah, these are a certain set of links and resources that are placed over here. You guys can look at them. Um, apart from that, do you have any questions? Is this sort of was this useful? Hmm? Sorry. Yeah. So I'm not sure about how you extend IRC capabilities. Over here it's much easier to extend the capabilities of this bot. So uh, if you guys work on Heroku or um, you know sort of yeah if you, if you guys have host your servers on Heroku there is already a ready made infrastructure for you called Janky. Okay so it's built on Jenkins by the GitHub guys and they have a nicely packaged thing. Now I'm pretty sure the same thing would have been possible in IRC this is sort of an easier you know thing because sort of the world is headed in this direction. But um, yeah, so a lot of people use this typically in sort of an IRC mode where there's a group chat, right? So where you have sort of group spaces or a group chat rooms or things like that, right? So so the campfire allows you that, uh, hip chat allows you that. Gtalk sort of is more individual. So if I add someone else, so this is the downside of this actually. If I add someone else to this conversation, sort of who bot doesn't understand whether the messages are being directed at him or not. So you have to sort of send, you know, based on his name, you'll have to send a message like saying R2, you know, um, whatever my command is. Right, for it to understand, if there are multiple people around. If it's the only one, it can sort of understand your commands directly. Anything else? Have you guys worked with something similar or that? Some, or what are your sort of pain points when it comes to build processes and what, what are the optimizations you guys have done because we would be definitely interested in understanding how can we improve ours. Uh, command line then you can directly sort of interact with Amazon APIs right? and Jenkins API. So the idea is to sort of simplify the interface you know, to make it sort of cuter and easier to use by people may not be really good at. No, no, you can send images and stuff. You can send, see, it has to be text-based data, right? Um, but but the beauty is that it can it can be made to do a lot of other things, right? You can call APIs of other systems. Um, you can, you know, so there's a thing that, you know, you can, someone has sort of done, uh, modified one of the scripts to play music in their system, in their office, right? So someone can say, okay, song, 
and it will sort of go and play that song. I mean, there's no limit to what you can do with this. Not yet, but you could do that. So the way our, uh, we do that is uh, because Jenkins can actually play a job. You keep talking about the career. Right. We can actually play a job based on email. Right. Uh, the way we play the job, we have a web form that sends that to the Right. So, I mean, at the end of the day, a new job creation is a post command, right? Yeah. Right. So, uh, you could sort of write syntax for this same way. Yeah, no, you can just type it. Yeah, that's right. Chat can go there. Send anywhere. Login to web form. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I like this more because sort of we have only these servers, you know. So, yeah, our model is we have these servers, you're constantly updating code, and those servers need to be updated. So the build jobs remain the same. Yeah, well, we don't even do manual build. What we do is we just call uh, call SVM and uh, yeah. run a bunch of fabric commands to start a build right. uh, based on what branch is calling. Right. Yeah. So you can also Jenkins has the ab ability to sort of sense change on GitHub. So if you you know commit code, actually the way it works is the other way around. When you commit code, Jenkins uh, GitHub sort of sends a a ping to Jenkins and says, okay, code has been updated on this branch in this repository. And if Jenkins has been configured to pick, you know, just automatically build anything and everything, then it can do that. So, you know, as and when you update your code, it can automatically get built. It's a great reactive tool. So, if you basically like do a bunch of stuff, if you just, like, if you just uh, code a uh, Jenkins build and you want to Yeah, that's what Costa was saying. You can send me SPM, whatever you have to do. It has a CDS, SPM, plugin, all of it. And also, it's a great plugin API. That's what I love about Jenkins. You can actually do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you can go into manage Jenkins and you can add plugins to this. Let's open up in a moment. So, you can add plugins typically. People use it with GitHub, but you could use it with any other system. But but the important part is that system needs to have hooks that it can expose to Jenkins, right? Otherwise, Jenkins will never know when something has happened on that system. So, in terms of SEM, all it does is expose SEM. It just does what it does. In terms of key, it does exactly what you do with Jenkins. So, I'd like to find out. Right. But so what would you do? You would put it in a cron or what? You would say yeah, any so one other. When you do a poll SEM, so if you actually look at the, if you can just create a Jenkins page in Jenkins and check poll SEM, it gives you a little, uh, um, little text where you basically put an SEM in cron with that. So, right. Right. And so what we do is we just go start no, a yeah, so that, that makes sense. So you can say poll every five minutes or an hour or so. But GitHub has hooks that it can expose to Jenkins and say, okay, you know, when, as soon as you commit, I'll sort of let you know that a commit is taking place. Yeah, but that's... Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, I know, but that's not, but that, that's it, that's more at the SEM level, you know, that's at the application level. Application level, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, GitHub can do that. Right. So, our use case to share it. So do you mail even on successful builds or you only mail when you start uh, crashes? So we mail successful deploys and we mail the scale yeah. And the best thing about uh, the Jenkins that you have to pull is it always knows who the last commit was from. So you can actually get into text and email to the writer instead of sending out a box and there's a bunch of people saying, oh, you broke the bill. Yeah. So it has a setting where it says, you know, notify the person who broke the build. I can show you that. The email notification, this last part over here. So it says send separate emails to individuals who broke the bill.
Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. We finished early. Good. <laughs>